COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dex Soap. One, practice social distancing. Two, wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our Dex Soap. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose Dex Soap for that extra cleanliness. Dex Soap is affordable and available nationwide. Nineteen hours 31 all across Guyana and it is time to enter room 592 with Dr. Yob Mahadia alongside his co-host Mr. Leonard Gildari, senior journalist of Kai Chor News this evening, their esteemed guest Mr. Freddie Kisun. Good evening gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening to you Mr. Kevin Smith. Uh, good evening to the Kai Chor radio crew. Good evening my co-host uh, Mr. Leonard Gildari. How are you tonight sir? Pretty good. I have a boy all the way from India. I shouldn't call them boy. I have my colleague <laughs> from the radio and he's making tea. So I'm, I'm going to try to, to, to see how to make tea in India. He's telling me a masala tea. You know about that, uh, Yo? Yes, yes. I know it's a wonderful tea. But, you know, you got to remember that uh, not because an Indian comes from India to make Guyanese tea, it's going to be an Indian tea. So just be <laughs> no, careful <but> just there. <laughs> I'm trying to see if the stomach is going to deal with it. <laughs> so let me welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, all across Guyana, the Caribbean, and wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to this room 592, where we unleash the truth. And the truth is what we unravel, unleash, and talk about every day. Ladies and gentlemen, we have team guests with us tonight, Mr. Freddie Kisoon. But just before we go uh, and enter into our discussion with Mr. Kisoon, I want to just share with you all what has been happening today. Today, as you know, we have seen a spike of COVID-19 disease, which Mr. Leonard Gildari would have uh, detailed uh, during our 1.30 to 4 o'clock program. However, the political situation in Guyana continues to be chaotic, continues to be despotic, continues to be the worst it can be. And we are certainly heading and marching into the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest elections ever. Today being, what, 121 days, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, with 121 days now behind us, I want to tell you all that this set of persons, and I'm trying to be very specific with my words here, the set of persons employed at GCOM have surely and certainly played their political hands. And I'm not talking about the commission, I'm talking about the secretariat. Brothers and sisters all across Guyana, you would recall that in 2015 elections, it was no other than, than David Granger that called upon the world to bring the sanctions upon the then Donald Ramatar presidency. And we have that video. And then, interestingly, one must remember that it is the same Keith Lowenfield in the presence of the then GCOM chairman, Mr. Uh, then Doctor. it would have been Steve Sturridge Valley, Mr. Steve, Steve Sturridge Valley. And Keith Lowenfield was explaining to the media how it was not possible to impersonate anyone at these polls. Tonight we have that video and we have that audio track lined up for you, ladies and gentlemen. As I welcome you all and I welcome Mr. Freddie Kisoon to Room 592, let us start our show tonight by listening to that soundtrack list and looking at that video of Mr. Keith Lowenfield just a couple years ago, 2011, I believe it was, that was saying that how the GCOM system was so good to disallow rigging. Of course, he was not talking about rigging within the secretariat itself. He was talking about rigging was impossible in the ballot uh, at the poll booths across the country. Have a listen. Have a look, ladies and gentlemen. Kevin. 
No, the, the issue on, on, on this this concept, and you're right, it has to be a rumor that you can vote at more than one location. It, well, I don't know. The reality is for you to vote at a polling station, you have to be listed to vote there. In that polling station, our presiding officer and the party agents will have a list that is specific to that polling station. Mm -hmm. So the get loaded. Mm -hmm. I've been meeting for you here. So when you come into the polling station, my list says that there's Keith Loan Field to vote. Keith Loan Field is announced, the agents um, for their respective parties say, yeah, Keith Loan Field. And they draw a line across the Field's name and then they go through the process and collect your ballot. And this time around, we show in the ballot to the agent that the stamp general and regional, and you go into your booth and you vote. Now, if you go to another polling station, then Keith Lone would not be, be there. List. So you're not even having access to polling station two or three, or you see many times. Mm -hmm. There is no accessibility because your name is not there. Even if you impersonate, you are doing feel your Vaseline has worked and you've um, removed the ink. When you go there, say you go there in uh, another name, but you don't have an ID card, then the folio that the chairman has referenced comes into play where our staff, GCOM PO and APO, have they have all the, the, the folio for all the persons listed at that specific polling station. So you come, you, somebody give you a name. You know Troy lives around the corner. Mm -hmm. So you come to say, I'm Troy Johnson. But, and you don't have an ID card. You have to pass through the process of probably having uh, the features of Troy. And our presiding officer will be asking you, since you don't have an ID card, as the chairman mentioned earlier, yeah. pro, um, what's the name? <coughs> and your date of birth is? And your mother middle name is? Okay. So the questions we have for you, you were coming to impose dates of Troy. So I think we need to and, and, uh, put to rest the concept that a man could leave polling station in, in Cummingsburg and go across to Alberta or Queenstown and and hop around it. It's just not possible. Okay. So it's just not possible. It is just not possible. These are the words of Keith Lowenfield, an election ago, an election cycle ago, sorry, when he would have uttered those words in the presence of Steve Surge Valley, then GCOM chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's either Mr. Lowenfield and team has perfected the art of lying and has perfected the art of rigging or there has to be probably a Keith Lowenfield that is an alien operating there now. Because today's Keith Lowenfield has prepared a report that has implicated himself in a rig and implicated and throw all of his secretariat under the bus by saying they all ran a poor election. Let me welcome for his comments, somebody who has been a very outspoken gentleman all through the years, regardless of who is in government. Hello? Mr. Freddie Kisun has said it as he saw it, he has called it as he has seen it, and he has been around and he certainly reads between the political line. Mr. Kisun, welcome to room 592, sir. And we just played Lowenfield's uh, audio and video and we are going to open the floor for you, sir. Okay, so thanks. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Go, yes. go ahead, Freddie. So, so go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Kisun. Tell us what's your thinking and what's your take on what's happening presently. And if you don't mind, please comment about your take and uh, with regards to the CCJ, uh, all of the hearings and stuff like that. Okay, there are two. There are two. Um, there are two questions that you asked me. One general, yes. one specific. I'm going to yes. deal with the specific one quickly because that doesn't involve any elongated discussion. What the CCJ. Yes. I have read what some of the judges have said in, in questioning the, the litigants. And I'm no lawyer, but I believe from what they have, the questions they've asked, 
it looks like they're going to rule in favor of the opposition. Some of the questions are, are, are quite clarifying. One of them mm -hmm. is, um, so could the Court of Appeal do something so ridiculous and nobody can change it? So mm -hmm. my take is the given some of the pronouncement by the judges in terms of the queries, it looked like they're going to rule against the government, but that should not have, that one should not put uh, one, all of one eggs in, in the basket because that, that is a formal bureaucratic decision. The power mm -hmm. corridors do not generally recognize formal legal uh, edicts when it comes to the loss of power. So that's the first question you ask, what I think about the CCJ. Right. The second question is the general one. What are the parameters, configurations, as I see them in the coming days? This has always been a very complicated polity. This is unlike the rest of the Caribbean. Politics and sociology and culture have never been straightforward, and it's always been esoteric, perplexing. What we are witnessing here the past four months, I think you have to look very hard in the post-colonial world since independence in the 50s and 60s around the third world, and even in developed countries after the Second World War. What is going on here is very, very bizarre. And I, I, I would say there are three strands that we have, three strands in the society right now that we have to pay attention for. One is the power thing. The power thing is people will go to extreme length to keep power if it involves loss of, of dignity, loss of life, loss of income. I believe the AFC and APNU leaders see this as the end of them. And, and therefore, they logically, and I, I stress the word logically and rationally, decide that they go to hold on to power and face the consequences because accepting defeat is a complete loss for them and maybe one doesn't know what the future holds. I mean, a good example right. is when the PNC lost in 1992. When the PNC lost in 1992, a lot of powerful people just went out into the sunset and we never heard from them again. Some of them were completely disrespected. I mean, a good example is mm -hmm. Hamilton Green. After 1992, the society found in him. He was never recognized as anybody, although he played a, a, a big political role, whether negative or positive. So I think that is what is facing them. A man like Moses Nagamutu and Kemajan mm -hmm. Tan see, see the, 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 the spiritual the, the spiritual life has gone. I mean, people are just yes. going to laugh at Nagamutu when they see him in the market, and he's not going to go in the market. They're not going to go mm -hmm. anywhere. So that's what is called a desperation, and you can liken it to people who are failing that their world is collapsing. Mm -hmm. So that's the first trend you have to think about when you when you look at what is going to happen in Correct. the coming days. The second strand is irrationality. And I do believe you don't have to be a psychologist or a psychoanalyst to see that there is a formidable, dangerous irrationality that have crept into these people. It's like you lost in the desert for three months, and then when you greet your wife, you're so disoriented, you, you, act, you, tell, you, you speak to your wife and say, Neighbor, neighbor Marta, it's not neighbor Marta, it's your wife, mm -hmm. but you're disoriented. Now, every day you see this disorientation. I mean, what could any human being put, any human being in the world put on the behavior, the depoma of these people? Take, for example, Ramjatan. I've sat yeah. down on my chair and listened twice to Ramjatan virtually conceding that they've lost the election to his staff. They are Correct. clear, unambiguous things like, um, well, I don't know if I will be welcome here in this ministry again when the PPP takes over, but I don't think they will do that. I mean, after all, 
some of the people, people, people still admire me. They think I'm, uh, they see me as big brother. How can you in the same breath say that you address your staff because you leave in one ministry to go to the prime minister's office? I mean, right. that, that, that is not repugnant or malignant. Those are innocuous adjectives. That is serious psychological imbalance. So that's the, the second strand. That's mm-hmm. the strand of irrationality. And I think it has crept into them at a very, very dangerous level. You have, you have a party that contacted a PR firm in Washington. A man, a man is a guy, he's writing a research project for you on what is going on in Guyana to submit to the U.S. government. And this mm-hmm. man called, the, say, the president is yes. a foreign <laughs> citizen. If he was familiar with Guyana, he would know the dual citizen thing occupied Guyanese for one full year. So who is this man that wrote this dossier? That's that's irrationality. Now, the third strand is the destructive strand. And I think you're seeing shades of Burnhamism there. I mean, Burnham's position was, look, I believe I have the wisdom to change a society for the better. And I am not going anywhere. I'm not listening to anyone. It's either when I go, the society going with me. That was his attitude, and that's the attitude that they have. And I think that is what is so, so demonic. I mean, that is what the average right. Guyanese has to be preoccupied with. Would the, are these people prepared to destroy the, the country simply because they would not be in charge. I think the third strand, which is the one, the destructive mode, I think that is the one we have to pay careful attention to. And I tell you what, when Ramjatan conceded defeat to, that, uh, to his staff, I think they called him and they said, why you do that? We are not conceding defeat under any circumstances. So you go and undo what you have done. So mm-hmm. it seems to my mind that those three strands doesn't augur well for stability and the future of the country. I, I think even though powerful forces are threatening them, I think they're going to say, look, we're going down to hell with the United States. Let them put mm-hmm. on the sanctions. Let them do what they have to do. We will do what we have to do. We are not giving up. But if Guyana got to go down, if we got to go down, we take in Guyana with us. Seriously, I think I would present that as my scholarly analysis of the present situation. Right. But I want to, you mentioned these three strands and very interesting, I must say, um, Mr. Kisun, they, let's, let's just uh, spend some more time on the last one because the destructive psychological aspect is indeed interesting and here is where i want to ask your comment your insight on for the past 54 years there seems to be none of our governments that one could look back on and say that's a leader well sorry except maybe for the period 1992 thereabouts the Chedi jagan leadership lean clean and mean government in my own view uh, you can agree or disagree. But there hardly seems to be leaders that Guyanese youngsters can say, here is who I want to be. I think you should mention Hoyt in that respect. And mm-hmm. in that context, I would put him on the same pedestal with, with Jagan, though I would probably put him above Jagan because I think Jagan was extremely disappointing when he came into power. And that's the thing about... That's the thing about people. I've, I've lived and worked with the Grenadian government after the revolution. And so I know when you're in government, it's, it's different. I think Jagan was an angel mm-hmm. uh, to the world, and, and the world liked him. But when he came into power, I think he succumbed to basic, basic um, instinct, as they say in the movie, that mm-hmm. his constituency were Indians, his, the PPP mm-hmm. is his fulcrum, and he's going to run Guyana with the PPP as his hegemonic fulcrum, 
and he's going to cater to the Indian. Now, he was not a corrupt man. Neither was Mrs. Janet Jagger and his wife, who later became president. I think, I think people exaggerate Granger's uh, honest um, financial honesty. I would say Mr. and Mrs. Jagan, for what I know personally of them, would not even have tolerated their colleagues being corrupt. In that sense, they're way, way above um, David Granger because Mr. Granger is fully aware of morbid mm-hmm. corruption among his ministers, uh, particularly right. one of them involved in the oil industry. Dr. Jagan would have fired that guy right away. Mm-hmm. I think Burnham had some problems with people who were also stealing from the state. But, mm-hmm. but I think Desmond Hart... Uh, needs to be situated in the context of post-colonial power. I, I think he was prepared to he was prepared to establish norms that would have allowed for the concretization of democratization. I, I think he became a different man. But all of them, even Mrs. Jagan, Chedi Jagan, and Desmondite, I don't think they have left a formula of blueprint, but most of all, have left a transformative legacy that the young people that came after 1990 could admire and say, we hope we have people like these again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the one thing, though, just on, on the height part, I, I hear you. Would you, would, you, would you agree or disagree that the 1985 elections may have totally, uh, you know, belied everything that, that Hoyt may have posit- positively stood for? No, no and yes. Yes, in the sense that when you commit those heinous crimes, people mm-hmm. remember you for it. But you could also commit those crimes and yet transform yourself and your society. There is something, I'm not a biblical guy, I'm not a, a believer, but... There's something called the road to Damascus, I think, in the Bible, mm-hmm. where you just change. I think the, the 1985 election was the second most uh, depraved electoral yes. fraud in our country's history, second to what went on in, in March this year. But Mr. Mm-hmm. Hoyt, for some, now let, let's say this, I don't know if you could use the word esoteric or strange, for some strange reason became a different man. And that there are a multiplicity of innovations he did that could have led to a better society. For example, mm-hmm. Mr. Green uh, demoted and ostracized serious mm-hmm. Stalinist autocratic people that Burnham elevated. Secondly, he destroyed extrajudicial violence that was a part of the Burnham regime, the House of Israel. Mm-hmm. Thirdly, he he, I think, charged uh, or made investigation into the head of the army who had mm-hmm. stolen, the head of the army at that time, who had stolen from a businessman um, mm-hmm. a consignment of shoes. Then there was the complaint about Mr. Robert Corbin and the, 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 the Dr. Yuli Hanneman's right. daughter. So, so there so were, there were me, a number me... of things. Like One of the things yes. I think he was serious of is to move away from having... P.S. permanent secretaries and those things that were part of political uh, uh, choppings. But I agree with you. The, the 85 election was ba- badly and terribly rigged. Right. So uh, I, want to, I want to extend an invitation to you now, uh, you and others that we can call on. We need to have some discussions that look at each period, very open discussion, like what you're, you're, you're sharing here now on assessing the presidents and the performance, because with Hoyt, you would also have to tag the slow fire move. But Freddie, I want to bring you right back. You use a phrase there that I think we want to push now into your analysis of Granger now. Now, you said that Hoyt, after he got to power, he changed some of his ways, and somehow or the other, he, he became into, well, not somehow or the other, but he purposely became into this person who showed a, a good appreciation of his position and wanting to lead wanting to lead and he did lead however i don't know that any period of the david granger's presidency 
would show that here is a man who wanted to lead and who led. And, and the depravity, as you pointed out, the corruption that he shut his eyes to. In addition, Freddie, just if I may, let's take a step back. 2015, it was the same David Grains who demanded the SOPs be released by GCOM and a whole set of things. But fast forward to 2020, David Granger has let his dogs loose in terms of attack on GCOM, um, attack on CARICOM, sorry, attack on everybody. And he comes out and said, these people are our allies, but he did not chide. He did not say anything about his own prime minister who has been on the attack. What and how would you compare David Granger then, sir? Well, anytime someone asks me about David Granger, I remember the, the words of that, that lady. I think she was, she was recently recalled as ambassador. Um, I can't remember her name. She's a well-known lawyer, but she was our, one of our ambassadors, if you can refresh my memory. Um, and she said to me outside the court, I've never heard about him. This is what happened. And um, I think there's a level of dishonesty in him that uh, has caused Guyana to be the problem in, and the PNC. Um, mm -hmm. just, just quickly, I think the PNC is finished with and I think he has destroyed the PNC. And that, that is sad because the PNC mm -hmm. speaks for a sizable percentage of people. And those people are going to be sad and lonely figures from 2020 onwards because they wouldn't have a party to lead them. But, Granger, I think Robert Corbyn had a dilemma. Uh, he couldn't, he was disgraced. He couldn't lead the PNC. He couldn't win uh, 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 handsomely to maintain the uh, uh, opposition position in parliament. So he had to choose a leader. He didn't want, um, he didn't want that lady, Faith Hardin, because he felt, you see, the problem with Corbyn, as I know him, he's, he always had a chip on his shoulder, and that is something he learned from Hamilton Green in the PNC. That once you don't have the doctor name behind you, or once you're not a university professor, or once you don't have this big scholarly background, they, they carry this chip on their shoulder, and Hamilton Green told me that he lost the presidency because the PNC leadership didn't see him as an intellectual. Now, when Corbyn became the PNC leader, he was ridiculed. I, I have inside information of what people like Aubrey Norton, Vincent Alexander, who pride themselves as intellectuals, if you know them the way I know them. And I think both of them have incisive analytical minds. They refused to accept Corbyn. And so Corbyn knew that his stock was declining. But he couldn't mm -hmm. go with Faith Hardin because he felt Faith Clarissa Hardin... Clarissa Real, right? You were talking about Clarissa Real. Sorry to... Um, yeah, yeah, Clarissa Real is the one who told me... Right. Then he became head of PNC. Yes. She never heard about him. All right. Now, All right. he couldn't go with Faith Hardin because Faith Hardin was a very large name in the PNC. And he felt Faith Hardin, Dr. Faith Hardin, would have said to him, Robert, who are you to speak to me? He couldn't go. Hello, good evening. He couldn't go. Uh, he couldn't go. Are you there? Yes, yes. He couldn't go with, um, uh, what's his name, the, the foreign minister, Carl Greenwich. Because Greenwich right. was an intellectual. And yes. the barrel was empty. Of course, James Bond contested the leadership, but Corbyn would have just dismissed him as a known entity. Mm -hmm. But Corbyn always had a good relation with um, Granger during the days of Paramount of the Party. Remember, Granger was, used to conduct ideological classes for the army. And there was a close working relationship between the army and the PNC. And uh, a relationship developed in those days. Corbyn knew that Granger was a, a, a frenetic admirer of Burnham and et cetera and the ways thing. So he picked on, uh, uh, on Granger. But Granger had no leadership qualities, wasn't interested in politics. But Corbyn insisted, look, take this thing on. What I don't know is if Corbyn tell him just take it on for a short while or if he promised Corbyn 
he'll be temporary, and then his ego sw- sw- was swollen, right. and he, he stayed on. Right. But the man was just catapulted into the situation, but mm-hmm. he had no political experience. Now, I thought for the first two years he would have eclipsed Ramatar as the most lackluster mm-hmm. president we produced. Um, but mm-hmm. really, this guy is mediocre, banal, intellectually dwarfed. This is, I, I, I think it's three of them we have to examine, and I would put him as the last. It's mm-hmm. uh, Bernard St. John in Barbados, um, Chambers when Williams died mm-hmm. in Trinidad, mm-hmm. and him. I think those are three real self-effacing leaders in the history of CARICOM. Of the three of them, I would think David Granger is the worst. He is the most incompetent, intellectually bankrupt, um, and incom- Freddie, incompetent leader CARICOM yeah. region has produced. And that, that, that is, is so sad for Guyana. Right. But Freddie, if I may, now, you, as a political scientist, how do you explain or how do you posit an opinion on the David Granger of 2013-2014 and the David Granger from 2015 to 2020? It's like two different men. Well, the reason for that is power. Um, you always have to look at the binary, uh, uh, that mm-hmm. binary. When you're out of power and you're fighting an autocratic government, remember, always, one always has to remember, anti-dictatorship fighters, no one is interested in their faults and in their infamous past. You're mm-hmm. concentrating on removing an autocratic regime and so you embrace the people who want to see the fall of right. that autocratic regime. So a lot of the flaws are overlooked by the population. And the most graphic example is um, Mr. Trump. I mean, Mr. Trump had so many faults, but nobody wanted one of those uh, 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 right. long-serving uh, Washington politician to be the president. So people said, this man come from TV, he come from business, give the man a chance who care about how much girlfriend he had and how much women he molest. We don't want the kind of people like, um, you, you know, Hillary Clinton. So that right. is what people said uh, about mm-hmm. the AFC, the WPA, the PNC. When they get in and they see the power they have and the material things that go with it. But the most important thing to understand in the disjuncture between Granger 2015, pre-2015 and Granger post-2015 is that he dreamt of a Burnham era coming back again. I, I attended, I delivered papers at academic four in which he was present and etc. And he wished that, you know, they would be again a kind of Burnham-like presidency, where African Guyanese mm-hmm. would, you know. And after 2015, he saw his chance of doing that. What, why he failed is because he didn't have the qualities of a Burnham or a, 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 a Ptolemy Reed. So he could not create a, a reenact, he couldn't reenact Burnham because he had no leadership qualities, but he resorted to the rhetoric and the so-called uh, 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 um, ideology of, 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 of Burnhamism. But Burnham. mm-hmm. he implemented very crude forms of Burnhamism without intellectually finessing these crudities. So, I mean, for example, but some of the things he did, Burnham would, would never have done. Um, you move people from important state institutions that you cite because of age they're in the early 80s, and right. you put a chairman for one of the most arduous, energetically driven job, eight a five-year-old man. Now, Bono was right. much smarter than that. So he became power intoxicated, and he wanted to reenact Burnham, but he didn't have the intellectual 
strategic and political qualities to do it. Thus, he became a ridiculous failure. Right. So, um, Freddie, uh, the, the David Granger we have seen over the past month and a half seems to be a gentleman, well, a, a man who is controlled. Um, you know, he allowed Harmon to say everything under the sun, and he emerged and he said, well, whatever Harmon say, I endorse. He then allowed everybody else. So he seems to be controlled. What's your take on that? I, I believe he has vulnerabilities that they know of, and they're either telling them to shut up, or if he takes a stronger position, they could embarrass him. I think one of this, the, 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 this invisible things that this society has not discussed, and I think the PPP have their own uh, 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 inequitous reason for keeping quiet on it, is that he may be a U.S. citizen for truth. Now, what mm -hmm. is very strange is that I don't think Michael Granger would have put that in. Now, I alluded to Granger yes. uh, earlier, Michael Granger. I, I mm -hmm. cannot see Granger writing a dossier in Guyanese politics, and he didn't know that dual citizenship was taboo. I think he knew Granger was a, a, an American citizen, and he put it in thinking it would work in Granger's favor. Now, it's possible they know he is an American citizen, and they're saying to him, well, we could easily let loose some information that would destroy you. Now, mm -hmm. the thing is, why is the PPP so silent on that? Um, from the time that dossier was out, and it says Granger was an American citizen, the PPP never mailed it and hardly paid right. any attention in it. And this is the reason why I think the PPP has adopted that position. Because given the state of things, if Granger is exposed and proven to be an American citizen, right now we, you have a de facto government, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a government in actuality. If the president should sick tomorrow or, 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 or not able to perform, you have to have an acting president. Now, if they bring down Granger, if the PPP brings him down by proving he's an American citizen, then Nagamutu will be the acting president. And they're afraid of Nagamutu because he is a, he's a low life. He's an own entity. He's an uncouth man. So he's likely to do more you know, nasty, dangerous things than Granger. And I, I think I stick with that analysis because Granger has a certain standing in the, middle, the black middle class and the mixed race middle class and in the well-to-do Guyanese diaspora. Um, mm -hmm. Nagamutu, no one has any respect for him across the world. So they are afraid that if you put Nagamutu, because of the venom don't forget, Nagamutu and Ramjatan are the leading persons supporting the rig election because they have more to lose than Granger. If, right. this, if the CCJ rules next week, Granger is going to pack his bag, go and live at Pearl, and write his book about the Rupununi uprising and the history of the army, etc. It is Ramjatan and Nagamutu that will be disgrace throughout this world, that will probably stay in their home and never show their face again. So if Nagamutu becomes the president, you're going to have a very, very nasty fight. And I suspect that is one of the reasons why the PPP is not investigating whether he's an American citizen. But there is some, there is some credence to the thing that he is getting pressure from the PNC. You have to remember that the PNC uh, is dealing with a man who was just catapulted into the leadership. Yes. The yes. thing about people like Valda Lawrence and Basil Williams, they've been around so long that they have access and they ground with PNC constituencies. Now, one of the weaknesses of Granger, in which he should never have been, allowed to continue after he became opposition leader is that 
in Guyana and Jamaica, I, I don't know about Barbados and, and, um, and, and, and Trinidad. They're slightly different from Jamaica, Antigua, right. Grenada, and us. In Antigua, Grenada, Guyana, and Jamaica, politicians could only be successful if they ground. Now, take a man, what we call in Guyana Portuguese, but he would be white or he'd be Syrian, Siago. Siago mm -hmm. was a, a, a white businessman, but Siago mm -hmm. used to seriously ground in Jamaica, the bird, the whole bird family. But the board would go into the market and talk to people like a bottom used to go into the market. Now, mm -hmm. someone like Hoyt couldn't do that. And unless Bonham anointed him, he couldn't win mm -hmm. a contest as PNC leader. Now, mm -hmm. Granger is very, very stiff. He comes from a very elite middle class background. And now, I'm not going to fault him for listening to classical music because honestly, I come from abject poverty world. Maybe for some reason, I like classical music too. Mm -hmm. But I ground, right? And I, I also like reggae. Massively, I'm a massive lover right. of reggae. I don't think he listens to reggae. I don't think he knows who is Boris Gardner. I don't think he knows those mm -hmm. kind of people. So mm -hmm. he's very elitist and very middle class. He is the man. He is the man, I'm saying this because I have direct inside knowledge. He is mm -hmm. the man who told the government, I don't want that marijuana amendment law. And so much pressure was on Michael Carrington from the AFC because the bill was in his name. He finally admitted that to the media. Mm -hmm. so, he, right. so the man, the man was the wrong guy mm -hmm. to lead a country. Do you take the PPP guys. Now, one of the biggest strengths of the PPP that is incomparable in, in the Caribbean context is that they were born into grounding. A man like, yeah. a man like Ramatal would walk in any market and say, what are you buying there? What are you buying there, y'all? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would do that. And in Andalal, and in Andalal is a man of the people. I know them. I grew up with them. They're not mm -hmm. stiff people at all. Now, that is why they can have their people behind them and they can get more people. For example, Pleasance only had a 51% turnout. You know what Pleasance is to the PNC oh, and right. the black people? Because nobody mm -hmm. knows this guy and this guy cannot, um, this guy cannot mm -hmm. talk to people and go on with people. And because he knows he cannot do that, he shies away from interactions with intellectuals and the media. Nowhere in the world, Yog, nowhere in the world mm -hmm. from the 19th century onward, but more importantly, in modern politics, where the media, far from being the fourth estate, is probably now the second estate, you shy away That's from talking well to the media. This man had three press conferences in five years. Correct. That, that Correct. disqualifies him from being the leader of a country. Automatically disqualifies him because you have to use the media like Trump to get your mm -hmm. message across. And he's Correct. very but, hurt and insulting right. with the media. When the, the lady asks him, when one of the asks him, if you lose the case in court, what would you do? I said what I said. You don't speak wow. to the media like that. No, listen, Mr. Granger is such a wrong person that I think the PNC knows that he was worth it. And I think they're, putting, they're, they're running the show. He, he's there, of course, with his Voldemite mentality. And he's no angel, far from it. But I think others inside there are saying, we go in this route. And you could say what you want to say. You have to follow. Right. So I, I do right. think there are factions. Mm -hmm. So, so Freddie, I want to uh, I want to slightly uh, disagree to a point with you, um, uh, and beg for your well. You know, you you uh, deal with it however you you want to hear now. Now, here is my what I'm going to push at you with. Granger seems to be giving out uh, a 
the air of, of being unbothered, of being this, as you rightly said, this middle class guy. I could get some water, and, please. <laughs> yeah. And he gets and he gets to be the person that says, Well, it wasn't me. I am just waiting on GCOM. Well, it wasn't me. It is that uh, this person, it wasn't me. So he wants to still be the guy that comes out shining. Yet, Freddie, yet it is the same Granger. Whenever he opens his mouth, he reveals unknowing probably to himself he's revealing some truth so a week and a half or two weeks ago uh, he said hey, you know i never saw these sops i saw a spreadsheet notwithstanding this whole country is crying about mingo spreadsheet he didn't bother to ask or so he says to the world the second thing that i want to pull uh, put to your attention is his most recent speech not the today one but uh, more within the last couple of days oh i think it's the today's one or yesterday, sorry, when he said in response to the Justice for All um, Party statement, he said, we have been meeting for the past 17 weeks. This means Granger knows exactly what is transpiring and, and it's probably directing to And the third and last point I'll make to you on this set here. Granger has also said, Keith Lowenfield is doing a good job. He has endorsed Keith Lowenfield. Over to you, sir. Well, I, I, I will try my best to clear up the contradiction, mm -hmm. if you see to the contradiction, though I do not uh, uh, disagree with you. I would more want to use the concept of dualism, that mm -hmm. he is not in hegemonic control of the PNC, but he's also one of the players who is keeping the faith. And therefore, he is spouting the rhetoric, the demagoguery, and the depravities that characterize the attitude toward regulation. So it, it need not be a contradiction. I, 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 I want to clarify my theoretical uh, outline in that I don't think the man is any, um, a, 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 any prisoner. I, I, I think mm -hmm. he is being told that this is the PNC line, and you must not divulge from it. On the other right. hand, I think in saying those uh, malignancies that he is spouting, and the lies and the deliberate distortion, that is part of the PNC's de So mm -hmm. there are two things going on. He is part of the PNC de but he is not in hegemonic control. Now, that is how I, I, I see it, and I would call that dualism. But I do, gotcha. I do concede the point that the guy, the guy is, is, is seriously um, uh, 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 intellectually deformed. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about uh, the other guy in, on, uh, very much on the scene, which is Mr. Joe Harmon. Joe Harmon seems to be, you know, the man who's pulling the strings behind everything. Well, Joe Harmon may be... Joe Harmon may be the face of the faction. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe one of the secrets that have not been revealed is that Raphael Trotman is part of, of the thing too. And I, 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 Raphael Trotman would be far more a strategic thinker and far more a chess board player than um, Harmon. Harmon is the face of the faction, but he's also a very incompetent face because he says a lot of contradictory things. Now, mm -hmm. someone like Chotman would not want to take on, to want to be the PR face of the PNC faction that is dominant because he, he is much smarter than that. He probably playing his cards safe, that if they fall, then he would not be remembered for these morbid, egregious outputs, whereas um, Harmon would be. But I don't see Harmon as being the strong man who has hijacked the PNC and is leading it. No, I think he belongs, he's the front man for an aggressive faction that includes um, Trotman, um, Basil Williams, Valder Lawrence, some uh, people like the ex 
uh, Migai, um, Collins, um, a, a few people from the diaspora, and I would not, I probably would include Cathy Hughes, because I think mm-hmm. she takes a very, very strong position like the PNC Wigger. So it's a faction, and I, I believe Harmon, maybe they've asked him to be the face of the faction, or he just said, leave it to me. But he's not doing a good job. But Chuckman will decline that role. And I, if, I, if I may, um, uh, Freddie, somebody is saying that they should get your smartphone to, so they could see your face when you're talking. So we'd have to take a donation. The boys, I second that, Freddie. You need um, to. Um, the boys in the studio are going to get I have a smartphone get. from President Granger. You do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to ask you, Freddie. I heard you. Would you give me another one yesterday? You, 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 you got to have respect for those people. They are the president and the prime minister, uh, Freddie. Well, <laughs> don't forget, you, you, you're old enough to know. You're not 16. Respect comes out of self-respect. Yes. If you don't respect yes. yourself, nobody's going to respect you. I don't respect Nagamutu because he's all over the place, jumping like a kangaroo. So then my question, you spoke about corruption not too long. I want to ask you pointedly, do you believe that David Greens is a, is a corrupt man? Um, they are, you have to deconstruct the word corruption. You should have qualified it. Do I believe mm-hmm. Granger has been above financial inequities as president? My answer would be yes. Do I believe Granger is corrupt in the deconstructed meaning of the word, like in terms of, um, mm-hmm. I, I have to be careful here, I don't want to, to get into libel. In terms of, for want of a better term, I hope your listeners and readers read between the lines. In terms of proper behavior, now that involves a, a lot of things, but I don't want to call those mm-hmm. other things because I don't want to get a libel. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to bring you part post-elections, uh, post-declaration, we're assuming that these things could happen. Scenario. Uh, but but the... uh, Leonard, Leonard, before you go there, uh, let, let me just take Freddie just, just a minute sure. back again. So Freddie, connect it. We're going to talk about it post-elections, but can you please connect the dots for me? One of our viewers has asked, what are your thoughts? Why would Granger agree to a recount knowing that he lost the elections? There are, there are a lot of undercurrents going on that we will never know. You know, one of the things about statesmen and stateswomen, they don't put all in their uh, memoirs and their autobiographies. And many things go uh, um, to their death, and we don't know. There is no written document at all that exists that, about Hitler and his persecution of the Jews. He never wrote a letter saying congratulations for what you did. There's, there's nothing. So, mm-hmm. um, we, we, but he had to know. So there are a lot of things that we will not know. Now, this is what I have been told. Now, I don't have any evidence of that, but I would say I trust some of those sources. Mm-hmm. I think Mia Motley and David Granger would probably write it in their memoirs, or they may not. But Granger was contacted because the Americans were putting pressure on CARICOM. The Americans didn't want to be seen directly getting involved in the mess. The Americans said this is a CARICOM issue. And I understand Motley, as chairman of CARICOM, called Granger and said, we have to settle this thing. And in that discussion, Motley said, there is a way out of this mess. You have the Mingo thing, you have the low and field thing. Look, we could settle it by CARICOM reverting to what CARICOM once did in Guyana. And that is the Cross formula, C-R-O-S-S. Mr. Cross came and did an mm-hmm. audit of the elections in 1997. And she repeated that. Why don't we have a recount? And with this we count, we settle everything. And he said, yes. Now, one of the things you have to look at, and this is where it goes back to my original statement when the phone rang and I answered that. This is a very complex, complicated polity. Now, mm-hmm. Granger agreed to the re- recount, but 
the recount would have been stopped if two full court judges had said, no, CARICOM cannot order a recount. But those judges um, um, allowed, when, they, when it went to the full court, those judges right. allowed the recount and just did a little nonsense thing by saying, yes, GCOM could do the recount, but they cannot allow CARICOM to take it over. And Motley, um, Rowley was annoyed and incensed. Rowley was saying, what did those judges said? We never went down mm. there to take over the recount. But the judges wanted the, the judges said the recount could go on. And they just placated the PNC by saying, G, uh, CARICOM cannot head the recount. Now, why did Granger agree to the recount and mm -hmm. the recount would almost was stopped? Now, that is a question that has to be answered. I right. do not think he agreed to the recount knowing he lost. I think he tried to placate Motley by saying, yes, we will have the recount. And then the PNC said, fine, but we can sabotage the recount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's, how I, that's how I see it. Thank you. Leonard, you were uh, back to your question. Sir. So we'll be coming back, let's say, post-elections, and uh, there's a scenario that the coalition or the uh, PNC takes the opposition. Uh, what happens, uh, should Guyana be worried, based on your analysis, that it's not going to have a strong uh, uh, opposition based on what we've seen right now? No, we're going to have a very weak, uh, disjointed opposition, and I think... We're entering a period of PPP's hegemony that may be stronger than the Jadmio hegemony because what has happened the past four months has literally elevated the political image, credibility, and strength of the PPP. And they're going to go in there with massive goodwill, goodwill from their supporters. What the second thing to note about it is that they're going in there with a moral revulsion of the PNC, their surrogates, and their supporters, what they have done. You can't blame them for having that moral revulsion because half the population in this country are under 18. And those people are destroying the future of those countries, of those people. Uh, Leonard, I went into Massey supermarket with my wife, and these young little teenagers, two girls came up to me, Mr. Kisun, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? They're just fearful. Now, how could you sit in a government and talk about inclusive governance and power sharing with people who are prepared to let Venezuela come in here for their own narrow, selfish uh, 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 um, instinct? Mm -hmm. we, we have Venezuela on the doorstep, and these people are prepared to do anything. Now, look who are the two people in charge of COVID uh, 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 policy making. Harmon, who every day and night is thinking about rigged election, and Nagamutu, who wants to stop a change of government because his life will come to an end. So they don't have time with COVID. So, yes, the question is you're going to have a very weak opposition. Secondly, I think there's going to be a lot of infighting because Granger is going to go and um, there's going to be a fight among the older ones and none of them have the moral, uh, meet the moral criteria of being opposition leader. Some of the young ones who are likely to succeed have tainted their character. I, I, um, you know, someone like Chris Jones, who I know personally, I thought he was a fine for the PNC, but the West isn't going to deal with him. He probably isn't going to get a visa. So you go, we're entering a period of PPP hegemony. I hope I'm using the, the word hegemony wrongly. <laughs> I, I would prefer to say PPP dominance. Um, mm -hmm. Hegemony is a stronger word. And I hope it isn't dominance. I hope Jack Dio has learned um, that you cannot run a country like that without transparency, without accountability. You have to take different classes and ethnicity into consideration. Um, my bet is that there are some young people in the PPP, like Anil, like um, Dr. Vinja Pasad, who may be able to check ballot. 
uh, be able mm -hmm. to check Jack Dio. But there's going to be some infighting in the PPP too, because I think people like Annie Landalal is going to say, we can't go that way again, uh, Jack Dio. And, and Freddie, uh, on that, uh, when it comes to the mood of the populace, do you believe we have a different uh, population now that has very little in tolerance for any government that's going to come and believe that they could do what they want to do? Well, we, 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 we are witnessing an irony here. And that is what is sad. We are witnessing an irony here. I think the young people are so frustrated by what has been going on the past four months that they likely to give the PPP a free pass because they are so brutalized mentally. Right now, we don't know what is going to happen next week. Those people right. for four months have been living in suspension. And they may feel, look, this man. Let, let, let me pause here and say to you what they're likely to say, which I don't agree with and I'm afraid of. They're likely to say, and I've seen this in my own young friends, Leonard, they, they, they're going to say, man, we had criticized these people. We had make these people a minority government. We still give our votes to the AFC in 2015. Not, not, not anymore. Man, give the PPP a chance. It's the PPP that saved us from this thing. I think a lot of young people are likely to say that. Mm -hmm. yes. And the PPP got back those people's votes. They did. So right. you were talking about mental brutalization by the AFC and the PNC for the past four months. Someone is going to say, oh God, the Minister of Health did that. No, man, better don't say anything, yeah, before you weaken this government. You see what happened? And I think the right. PPP is going to benefit from that. I am hoping desperately that the PPP learned the lessons of the past. But do people really learn the lessons of the past? Mm -hmm. Well said, and that's a hope I, I'm sure we all have, that their, um, their stay in opposition has really given them some an opportunity to gather some change in their their way of doing things. Freddie, I want to bring you to the, uh, the GCOM, the Commission and the Secretariat. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Alexander in Room 592 would have said to everyone that it was he, um, as a commissioner, who had stopped Gokul Budu in his tracks from making a wrong declaration. Fast forward that to what's happening now, it seems like the commission or the commissioners feel that they cannot intervene and Lowenfield has said openly nobody can tell me what to do I have to do what I have to do and the chairman has no op op um, no option but to take my advice your comment sir the the PNC on the on the Granger had decided when the election results came in in 2015 that the AFC had gone out of existence and they remember the words uh, of past analysts gone by, that the PNC cannot win an election of their own. And that is why Cathy Hughes kept insulting them when they didn't want Ramchatan as a prime ministerial candidate by saying, y'all never could win an election on their own. The PNC decided in May 2015 that they have to rig the election to stay in power and to reenact Burnhamism. And from that day on, the, 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 the Wigan had begun. The origins of the Wigan had begun. Now, if you take the July Gazette, if you go back and, and, and you're a researcher and an analyst, and you probably will do this in the coming days, um, if you go to the July 2015 Gazette, you will see where this was the beginning of the rigging of the 2020 elections. In that mm -hmm. gazette, Joe Harmon had 18 portfolios, 18 jurisdictions, 18 state authorities. Nagamutu as prime minister had four. That was the beginning of it. Now, the sum number two, if you look at the Ministers that were assigned 
before they were legally uh, uh, gazetted. The Minister of Natural Resources was um, Rupert Rupnerlein. Rupert Rupnerlein, yes. as the designated Minister of Natural Resources, put on a pair of long boots and went and inspect a caved in gold mining pit in which a number of miners died. Then mm -hmm. suddenly, Rupnerlein turned up as the Minister of Education. Christopher Ram, in a letter last week in the paper, said he raised that with the WPA, and the WPA just glossed it over. They wanted a PNC person in charge of natural resources because that goes right back to Burnham. The, right. the African Guyanese do not control the resources. You have to use the state to empower African Guyanese. And that is where Rupna line was, was removed. So step by step, they knew that the election was almost lost in 2015, and they, may, they will not win it in 2020. So they now settled on the hogging of state power. Um, um, Granger demanded the removal of Silal and David Ramnerain. Um, much to his credit, I think he's a washed-up politician that is now will end up as a disgrace. But much to his credit, Ramjatan told um, Granger, I cannot remove Silal. If you do that, then it's going to have financial implications for his future. Let him go and leave, retire, and he gets his financial benefits. Then it was GCOM. They deliberately removed that deputy um, Vishnu Prasad. Uh, to put Roxanne Myers. Now, I could tell you the conspiracy to put Roxanne Myers there, but one person who was involved in that could sue me for libel, so I, I, I don't want to get to that. <laughs> now, this country should have been alarmed and should have started the alarm bells ringing when that guy, the chairman, voted against the continuation of Prasad and told the constitutional body for which he should have been arrested and charged, he told the ERC, a constitutional body, I interviewed him, he was a shady character, a shifting character, he didn't look like he has integrity, and that is why I voted against him. Chicom Chairman mm -hmm. Patterson never met Vishnu Prasad, never spoke to Prasad, and was a pathetic, unadulterated liar. And for that, the country should have demanded his removal, and a criminal private charge should have been brought on, against him. For You cannot mm -hmm. lie to a constitutional body. That is perjury. So, mm -hmm. um, Yolanda Ward, the PRO, refused to appeal in front of the ERC, and the ERC chairman, instead of uh, uh, quarreling with Schumann, a fine young future politician, he should have been quarreling with Yolanda Ward, who refused to appeal in front of the ERC. So the whole stage was set for this thing. One man right. saw it coming. One man saw it coming. And the reason why he spoke up against it, he was not enamored with power, and he didn't, he didn't care. And that was... That was Nigel Hughes. Nigel Hughes saw this thing come in. And you've got to remember, Hughes came from a background of his days at St. Stanislaus. He saw when Father Dark was killed. Right. His father was harassed by President Burnham. And mm -hmm. you saw this thing coming, and Hughes demanded an urgent meeting of the AFC to cut down on Harmon's uh, portfolios and share it equally. And the AFC just uh, sidelined uh, um, you, and you said, look, I'm gone. So this right. thing about GCOM started from 2015. And we saw it in the ministries. We saw how state power was reorganized. You, you have a country where 50% of the people are under 18. Why do you need a separate ministry of citizenship? Right. So all of, all of those things were the uh, antecedents of Mingo, yeah. all of those, of Mingo and Low and Field. Correct. Um, Correct. Uh, uh, most ignorantly, you know what Sixby said, man, oh man, 
full of himself, just in brief authority, most ignorant in what he's most assured of. They think they, with, 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 the, with the advice they're getting from people who are living in Iceland and Greenland and don't know anything about Guyana, and talking about the diaspora advisors, mm -hmm. probably tell them they could reenact Bonham and rig the election. We're living in a different country. We're living in a country where... The PPP and the Jagan and Boise Ramkalan are dead and gone. You have some young, emotional men who would fight the PNC, and they have right. hundreds of millions of dollars. Jagan used to got to go and beg people for money. You would mm -hmm. fight, you're living in a time when Jack, the opposition leader, is a capitalist. Jagan was All running right. around talking about Leninism. So, right. mm -hmm. so that, that is All where right. we're at now. That is where mm -hmm. we're at now. And if you, I are may, so, uh, you are so right, Freddie, because, uh, you know, a couple of nights ago, we were, Leonard and I were talking to some other guests. And, um, you know, in terms of, of the, the plot that started, and you remember that Atlanta, Georgia um, speech that David Granger gave, and he said he don't know how they could win the 2020 elections. And also, you are so right to, to, tie, to, to bring that up, because we did mention this too. Can the Guyanese people imagine what would have been the state of Guyana today had Patterson been the chairman of GCOM. God knows. For one, one thing for sure, this election would have been over and done with. Leonard, you were saying. Yes, uh, my apologies there. The, I, I want Freddie to address two quick questions, uh, maybe in his own little way. The, the future of the new parties, uh, let's say elections 20, 20 to 25, that's one. And two, let's assume that we hold it then. The, the other part, what would be his dream pick for a PPPC cabinet? Well, um, a PPP cabinet for 2025, what are you talking about now? Now, now, two different questions. You want oh. me to repeat them? I don't, I, um, yeah, yeah, quickly, quickly. Okay, quickly. who would you pick for a PPPC cabinet? Um, uh, the persons that you would like to see. And secondly, yeah. I want you to uh, talk about the future of the new parties, let's say. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. For I don't want to get into personalities, and I don't want to elevate people I don't know. The person I have known for a very long time, and I've been able to assess his character, um, although I think he may have some faults, I, I am definitely one that would support Anin Andalal because. I know aspect of his personality as his teacher at UG and as someone after UG that I've been very close with. We never fell out. Of course, he knew I had to do what I had to have to do. I am a critic of authoritarian power. That is inside my DNA. That is how I came up uh, 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 as a youth, as a university freshman, as a university graduate, and as a university teacher and an ac academic. But in all, in all this thing, I know he has qualities that I do not see in other PPP leaders. Some of those qualities is that he's willing to listen. He's willing to go down to your level and understand your problems. Now, he may not be able to solve it. And most of all, I think he has a modesty in him that needs to be matched by other PPP leaders. I think Anil Nandalal has virtually held the PPP's credibility together since they lost power. I, I, would, I would suggest that he will have to play a huge part. I don't know anything about the rest of them. I have a problem with um, the, 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 the former sports guy, Frank Anthony, because too many people have complained to me about his incompetence during Carifesto. People have literally cried to me that they were not paid. Ordinary small people who carry Festa Secretariat bought things from and did not pay, mm. and um, they went to him. So there's a lot of baggage there. I, I, I support my country, and I support free and fair election. I tell you this, Leonard Gildari and Yog Mahadio, I don't support the PPP. I, 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 I am behind my country. My country is Correct. my country. I, my daughter has a right in the next 10 years to see change of government and not grow up here about the PNT, PNC. But the PPP has done bad things. They have a chance again, and they should go to the altar of confession. Sorry to use that term. I'm not a, a religious person. I cannot mm -hmm. speak for the recipe, but that, that, that lady, um, uh, Dr. Vinja Prasad, 
seem to be all right, except I'm concerned about she being such a devout Hindu and the tendency may, may want to you know, patronize our constituency. I hope I'm wrong. There are some young people in the PPP coming up, but the problem with the PPP and the PNC, those monster parties and their monster culture tend to swallow up the young people. Take a man like Barra Jack Dio, he didn't know anything about the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. He was in his napkins. In, but he turned out to be the worst, one of the worst leaders in the Caribbean. And he turned out to be a monstrous PPP leader. So all these young people that I saw from my bedroom window, bearing the sun and bearing the rain to watch that recount, those two parties have a culture of sucking up them and turning them into monsters. So with that kind of analysis, I prefer to speak only of those I know. And I know Anandalal. There is a guy who filed a criminal charge against Lone Field, Desmond Morion. That's a friend of mine. That is someone I've known for 30 years. I think he would be a good pick, but I don't know if they will want to put him in because in these countries, people look at qualifications and what have you. But Desmond is a very good PPP stalwart. I cannot. I cannot count to the rest of them. I believe Gail Teixeira and Clement Rohe and Donald Ramatal have to ride out in the sunset. They had their time. I don't think they could contribute to a new Guyana, and I think they are vastly overpowered by the instinct of PPP's hegemony that they grew up with. So they, they, just, they just have to go. Um, Inja Chanda Paul and all those people should just be given a pension and let the people in the Ministry of Agriculture come every day at their home and plant their gardens for them. That, that is how I see it. As to the new political parties, they have been very, very disappointing, and I, I, I think we should be very critical of them because during the 2020 election, they, they showed the egoistical, egotistical uh, uh, obsessions. If they had merged, you have a crucial election. If they had merged, they would have won at least two seats. Now, I was in the National Park when the head of change uh, battle, change Gannett, called me. And uh, I don't know. I have to apologize to Mr. Badal and apologize to Guyanese. But the phone, it's not a smartphone, but it was on. And it recorded what he said. It's nothing unsavory, he said. But in that, he rejected my plea to join with the other small parties. And in rejecting the, the plea, the ego was showing. And look, look what happened to him. I asked Ms. Lam from the Citizen um, Initiative, why don't you collate with the other small parties? And they refused to collate um, the, because each one of them were full of egos. Now, when you start off, off like that, you're going to disappoint young people. We had a crucial election. It was best for them to come together. I know there were some complaints about coming together, and the complaints were about Ralph Samkalan, that they could have merged, but he insisted on being the presidential candidate. I think if that is true, um, Ramkalan was wrong because I think Ms. Lam and Badal and them would have made a better presidential candidate. I mean, they just had more going for them than Ram Karan. Now, I don't know if that is true. If it is true, they have an opportunity now because I think Mr. Ram Karan will go off the scene. I cannot see the seat that the third parties get. I cannot see Ram Karan going in Parliament. They will have to give Schumann and then alternatively Correct. Timothy Jonas. But they, they, they have... A, they have, a, they have a, a chance now. I think Schumann is the problematic guy because if he's going to stay in power, he has to have a separate party because the Amerindians are going to root for their own man. If he merges with the rest of the parties, the Amerindians may well say, well, look, he gone over to other people and they may very well go back to either the PPP or, or what have you. Right. But those other parties... This guy, Josh Kanai, has proven to be a very good one for the future. So it's Timothy Jonas. 
And then there's, 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 there's another guy in, in, in Anu, I can't remember his name. The lady, um, the lady from the Citizen Initiative, Lam, she taught my daughter right. at um, um, uh, the school, the Catholic school, mm -hmm. uh, Marian Academy. The, this lady in the new movement, this doctor, I mean, the lady was in tears when she was talking about the future of her country. They, they have to understand that they are now new on the scene, and they have mm -hmm. to spend years grounding with people. Correct. So they have to call a meeting, several meetings, dozens of meetings, and talk about merging. If they merge and the PPP continues in its old ways, there is a chance that they could create a minority government as right. what the AFC did in 2025. That, right. I, I think, uh, uh, encapsulates my thoughts about your Freddy. two questions. Um, I yeah. hope you didn't, you didn't have a pun on the word when you say in your small way, because I am a small built man. <laughs> Freddie, just, just let us go back quickly. We, we got another five minutes to go. Um, Lennox Schumann's entry into Parliament, whatever way this election goes, certainly um, the join the list is going to see Lennox Schumann enter into Parliament. But isn't it? What's your view on this? I, I feel that uh, my view has been that Lennox Schumann entry into politics, given the divide as it is, places him in a terrible spot. If he goes, if he makes one agreement to the PPP, he will be deemed, <laughs> oh, he was always PPP. If he doesn't, if he goes to the APTO AFC side, same thing. D he'll be damned if he do and damned if he don't. It, it, it will have to do with the issues and it will have to do with his explanatory power. If he has, if he has his intellectual uh, 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 um, muscles up to scratch and he gets good advice, he, he, he's definitely not going to go with APNU. Um, I don't think it's going to be APNU. There's not such a name. He's not going to go with the PNC because they have been very terrible to him. In fact, as soon as he entered the race, the Chronicle had him front page saying a lot of nasty things about him. My feeling is that these guys like Schumann and Timothy Jonas and Josh Kanai and them, they are so bitter at how they've been treated and what they have seen that they may want to give the PPP a chance instead of weakening the PPP because you have this sword of Damocles hanging over the head of Guyanese. Watch it. You weaken these people, these monsters may take, see that opening and come back. And it's for that reason, I think the PPP in the first few years, people like Schumann, um, are going to go easy on them. What I think Schumann is going to do, he may ask for his constituency to be elevated in very, very strong ways. You have to, you, we have to do something for the Amerindians. I think the Amerindians are vastly underrepresented in education, in the state, in scholarships, uh, in sports, and I think his best bet is to push the PPP in, in, in that direction. But I can't see him going or uh, voting with the PNC. And if they, if they say, look, he gone with the PNC, he's going to say to hell with them. Y'all have no moral authority to criticize me. Correct. Correct. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, Freddie, I would really like to, Leonard and I, I guess I'm speaking on both of our behalf to continue this conversation and another time that we can mutually agree on because a couple of things that we didn't get to discuss. Well, the, COVID, we to... the COVID is ill. I'm a, very, I know. I'm a very domesticated family man. I don't stay away <laughs> from my wife. So every night, even when I was young, I was home. And I'm always home <laughs> in the night. And plus, she, um, after the PPP's consistent attack on me, I'm an embargo. I don't go out in the night anymore. Could so we send you a smartphone for you, or you still well, have that one well, that was given Freddy, to you? What, the phone that going to give me? Yes. I, I looked at it um, that he gave me, and it was a bogus phone. And the one that Nagamutu <laughs> gave me, when I opened it, it exploded. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. So, Freddie, because we need to talk a couple more things on another call show. Me, call, another me, call, night me night and, call me anytime. Call me anytime. Night like because these, I, I would want. Yeah, I would want us to continue to analyze uh, the, the potential role of Schumann in Parliament, as well as, I mean, you know, uh, the, the divisiveness and the, the whatever WPA has done to these last elections and, and really in killing 
the memory of, of Walter or trying to kill the memory of Walter. Well, I, I, I think to... one of the greatest heresies in post-colonial politics, I, I'm going to, they may have greater heresies uh, after the war in, in Europe, but one of the greatest heresies in the third world, perhaps in world politics, is Desmond Chotman mm -hmm. participating in rigged election as a policymaker of GCOM using GCOM to rig elections and said he's doing that because he thinks he's following Walter Rodney's um, legacy. <laughs> oh, my God. I have to say, I oh, know. my God. Although I'm not a <laughs> religious person, no, I am telling you something. After that, <laughs> Desmond, Hart, Desmond Chotman should be charged with moral treason if they such a charge. <laughs> Where do you come Eddie, up it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to have you in Room 591. We certainly look forward to for a repeat and uh, for more engagement with you, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, no, no problem. I don't, I, I don't mind at all. I don't mind wonderful. at all. Right, wonderful. Right. Wonderful. Do give our regards to your wonderful family. Yeah. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to that time when we have to wrap up our night in Room 592. And, you know, tomorrow, Mr. Leonard Gildari will be entertaining us all uh, with his words and his leadership on elections, what's in COVID-19 was, Leonard? Yes, absolutely. One third we're going to be back. And so we are going to continue to look... Uh, we are going to continue to look at uh, that uh, the increasing number of COVID-19 cases. Um, uh, what uh, is important is that uh, the number of cases has reached uh, proportions where we should be very, very worried, uh, Yog and the people of mm -hmm. Guyana because we have not been paying attention to it and uh, it, uh, we are paying dearly. I think there was another death recorded today. I think a biotician, mm -hmm. uh, I think is the latest one. Uh, yesterday we would have learned about one a person that's 42 years old that died and so these things are, um, especially what is coming out, the news that's coming out from Region 1, we should be paying close attention to that area. So we are going to look at that as well as, I think, tomorrow night, Room 592. I understand that you have yes. Mr. Selwyn Peters. Maybe you quickly you want to tell us in yes. closing out. But thank you very much. See you at yes. 1.30 tomorrow. Yes, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been good to have Mr. Freddie Kisun tonight. As we know, uh, everybody appreciates his views and his opinion and, of course, his application of, of political science to, to whatever illogic is happening in Guyana. It's been good to have you, Freddie, and we certainly look forward to having you again. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night in Room 592, we'll have another intellectual, another person who has stand, uh, withstood a lot of pressure, standing on his own ground. He's no other than Mr. Selwyn Peters. He is an attorney of law. At law, he has been a part of the Guyanese scene for a very long time and has been one who has uh, taken on the mantle of leadership in his own way. So we are looking forward to having Mr. Selwyn Peters tomorrow night in our room 592. However, ladies and gentlemen, Guyana is, is, is ours. We got to decide what we want to do with this country, regardless of how the politicians de decide to treat us. We all got to realize that this country is ours, does not belong to the politicians. It belongs to you and I. I want to close tonight, uh, tonight's room 592's door by saying thanks to Glenn Lal for making this uh, airtime free and available so that we could have this program every night and to thank the Kaito News technical, Kaito Radio technical crew, Kevin, Joshua, and everybody there are working hard to make sure that everything happens without any glitches beyond, uh, of course, uh, what is within their control. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful night, stay safe, and when you can, do a prayer for this beautiful country of ours. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye now. Good evening. COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dexo. 1. Practice social distancing. 2. Wear your mask when leaving the house. 3. Wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our deck soap. 4. Cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose deck soap for that extra cleanliness. Deck soap is affordable and available nationwide.
Skycher Radio. Covering Guyana from coast to coast. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Burbies 99.5 FM. Skycher Radio. 